The old York prison is perhaps America's most eerie, abandoned 19th century correctional center, complete with endless folklore, adding mystery to its already very frightening appearance. Although little is documented about what transpired within these walls, we do know that bedbug infestations were rampant and capital punishment was carried out at ease. It has even been speculated that prisoners here were served roadkill for dinner. But where does the truth lie, and what is the fate of this disheveled old building? Join me to find out, as today we discover the history of the Old York Prison. I'm your host, Ryan Sokash, and you're watching It's History. You might be wondering why such a small Pennsylvanian town needs such a massive prison. And it's a really good question, since from today's perspective, the town's population and significance doesn't seem to warrant a facility that size. But this wasn't always the case. In fact, the town of York is considered by many to be the cradle of the United States. York, also known as Yorktown in the mid 18th to early 19th centuries, was founded in 1741 by settlers from the Philadelphia region and named for the English city of the same name. By 1777, most of the area's residents were of German or Scotch-Irish descent, and as that population grew, the town was incorporated as a borough on September the 24th, 1787, and later as a city on January the 11th, 1887. York was critical to the Union, serving as the temporary base for the Continental Congress from September the 30th, 1777 to June the 27th, 1778, during the American Revolutionary War. It was here that Congress drafted and adopted the Articles of Confederation, though they were not ratified until March of 1781. Additionally, Congress met at the courthouse that was built in 1754. The original was demolished in 1841, but later rebuilt as the Colonial Courthouse. For these reasons, York styles itself as the first capital of the United States, although historians generally consider it to be the fourth capital, after Philadelphia, Baltimore, and Lancaster, which was a capital for a single day. The 19th century was a crucial time of growth for York, which according to US Census reports from 1800 through 1840, ranked the city within the nation's top 100 most populated urban areas. This was only exacerbated during the American Civil War when York became the largest northern town to be occupied by the Confederate Army, in turn bringing an overall greater awareness about the city and its growing widespread reputation. After the war, York remained a regional center for local agriculture, but increasingly became an important industrial center with industries such as steam engines, railroad manufacturing, and paper making. Around this time, the town more than tripled its population. Naturally, as thousands flocked to York for the various opportunities, some bad apples were mixed in. Hence, the local jailhouse became very overcrowded, not to mention York began having an issue with poverty and homelessness. Basically, the town needed to establish a corrections system. The first York County Jail was built in the year 1755. The building was exceedingly small and contained two large rooms to hold prisoners. There were no individual cells and the facility was a mess. The building had many barred windows to keep the inmates from escaping, and as the population grew, an addition was added in the early 1800s. But by 1854, the building had deteriorated so much that it was torn down altogether. A year earlier, the York prison had finished construction, and originally, it was just one element that formed a wider complex of county custodial facilities, including the York County Poorhouse and Hospital. The County Poorhouse, or County Infirmary, was a type of welfare institution that existed in many counties in the United States during the 19th and early 20th centuries. These institutions were established to provide care and assistance to individuals who were destitute, homeless, or unable to support themselves due to poverty, illness, disability, or other reasons. The concept of the County Poorhouse was rooted in the idea of public welfare and charity. This concept was brought to America as inspired by the English Poor Laws, which date back to the 16th century and were instrumental in shaping the concept 
of workhouses and poor relief in Europe. The Poor Laws established a system of caring for the poor and destitute, which included workhouses for those who were capable of work but unable to support themselves. The workhouse system aimed to deter idleness and offered minimal support while requiring inmates to work in exchange for their care. The phrase going to the poorhouse or send you to the poorhouse originated from this historical practice. It conveyed the idea that someone was facing financial ruin or destitution and would need to rely on public assistance for their basic needs. Anyhow, when certain lines were crossed in York County, punishment became a factor, hence the need for more severe incarceration. The York prison was opened in 1853 and featured an imposing, almost castle-like design, very unfamiliar to its current look. This was typical for prisons of the time in Pennsylvania, as government architecture was frequently planned for utility, but also to communicate a message to the public. In the case of these old prisons, I think the message is clear. When inmates were booked, they'd be assigned a cell block near the rear within the housing unit. For recreation, there was an undersized courtyard, a reportedly very unsanitary cafeteria, and limited access to restrooms and showers. The chosen location was perfect for detention, as the combination of a nearby river and railroad embankment formed natural barriers, while the otherwise flat plot that the building itself occupied offered great sight lines for guards. Additionally, it was far enough away from the historic Old Town that the good standing citizens wouldn't be bothered by the view of a prison, as the saying goes, out of sight, out of mind. Yet even if the prison wasn't on people's daily radar, the conditions within were so appalling that convicts made their voices heard by writing into local papers. In 1892, a convict known as Baltimore Joe got three months behind bars and was so disturbed by his experience that he wrote to a local newspaper complaining, exclaiming that the inmates survived off a morning ration of bootlegged coffee, meaning the quality was adultered with other questionable substances, and a common loaf of bread followed by another ration of bread in the evening. However, on Wednesdays, the prisoners got a pan of what he called shadow soup, a type of bean broth that Joe felt was a treat compared to just bread. By 1906, York's first major prison was too small for the still-growing population, so it was replaced by the colossal building that we see today. Going back to the notion of messages within architecture, this five-story red brick structure measuring 30,000 square feet made a statement of its own, brutality. The substantial rectangular structure is adorned with rows of vertical windows, set back and filled with sturdy bars. An arched main entrance adds to its architectural appeal, along with a decorative cornice positioned just below the roof line. Getting locked up here was a very scary experience. Just stepping out of line could result in solitary confinement, a padded room said to make men lose their minds. These facts are perhaps the most frightening aspect of the story. Consider this. In part, we are talking about people going to jail, a place where the accused are not even convicted of a crime yet, yet they are subject to conditions that frequently result in personal injury. So perhaps it would be prudent to point out that if you ever find yourself in that situation or any other unjust situation for that matter, you might want to seek legal help immediately. Check out our sponsor, Morgan & Morgan, America's largest injury firm trusted by over 3 million people who have called them in their hour of need. Submitting a claim for injury doesn't have to be a burdensome process. In fact, you won't even need to visit law offices to protect yourself. You can submit a claim and have a lawyer review your case with only eight clicks on your phone. Morgan & Morgan has modernized the injury law process, making it so easy to submit a claim. You can submit your case details, sign contracts, upload documents and medical records, all from your cell phone. Morgan & Morgan pretty much balanced the playing field by making support accessible because their clients don't have to fear upfront legal costs. They only pay if they win. So don't overthink it. Take action to protect your rights and Morgan & Morgan will fight to get you the compensation you deserve. If you're ever injured in an accident, you can submit a claim at www.forthepeople.com slash its history or by dialing pound law 
That's pound 529 on your phone. Thank you, Morgan and Morgan, for supporting the channel. And now, back to the story of the Old York Prison. Segregation was another issue that created undue pressure amongst various groups within the facility, and we'll elaborate on that later, but for worst case scenarios, prisoners feared the so-called hanging hook, with a trap door that was used for capital punishment. By 1950, complaints about the food arose again, with very disturbing claims of prisoners being fed roadkill. And now considering the controversial nature of this claim, I looked into it in depth, and the only public mention I ever found proposing that inmates eat roadkill came about way later in the Philadelphia Inquirer in 1996, when the commissioner of Clarion County proposed that deer found along the road often has a lot of good meat on it, and that local deer meat could be an improvement to the highly processed meals prisoners ate. At great controversy, others also observed that since prisoners frequently cleaned the roadside, there might be a very efficient synergy at hand. That being said, in reality, this was highly unlikely, as even in the 1950s, intentionally feeding inmates any contaminated food would have been highly illegal, even back then. What's more likely, however, is that the prisoners compared the food to that of roadkill, which makes a lot of sense, as according to the daily record, prisoners were absolutely served a dish named food loaf. Food loaf is a kind of food dumped into a blender with flour or cornmeal that you bake later. However, given the extremely low quality of prison food, in light of the fact that it's highly processed for an extremely long shelf life, and the random combination of ingredients you might encounter in food loaf, the roadkill might have actually been a better bet. The article's author tasted some food loaf while he did the story, recalling the food had, quote, curious lumps in it, which he didn't want to think about. A problem pointed out in the publication, never to be forgotten, which recalls that the prison symbolized a lot that was not right about York up until the 1950s. Underlining the jail's practice of segregating black and white prisoners in different cell blocks at night, Black and white males also received visitors on separate days, although visitors could see minority and white women on the same day. Should be pointed out here that this practice was not isolated to just this one facility. It was commonplace in the United States back then. The publication also asserts that when only one woman was incarcerated, she was housed in a padded cell, perhaps to keep from opening larger quarters for a single inmate. Furthermore, two former inmates claimed that the only meat they were ever served in a two-week stint was venison from a carcass state police had removed from a county road. Once again, bringing up this uncomfortable, dark accusation about the prison. The inmates also claimed that the jail was full of bedbugs, and jail officers did not demand newcomers to take a bath or shower. In other words, it was filthy. And now, perhaps bringing a bit of validity to these claims, a York County osteopath had spent the night in jail rather than paying a parking ticket, and he made the same claims. So claims of prisoners eating roadkill accompanied by far more documentable accusations of racial segregation and civil rights violations filed by African-American prisoners brought unwanted controversy to the county to the point that by the 1970s, change was due. The part of the complex known as the poorhouse was removed and replaced with Alexander Good's school. Then, the Old York County Prison shut its doors in 1979, and inmates were relocated to the newly established correctional facility on Concord Road. The new facility has a maximum of 2,400 beds and 276 beds for the work release center. Unlike the previous establishment, however, the new center takes a far more modern approach to justice, with the mission reading, the mission of the York County Prison is to maintain a safe, secure environment for a diverse population of incarcerated individuals, staff, and visitors. We are dedicated to implementing innovative security methods and working with our community partners to provide quality education and evidence-based treatment programs to increase the probability of successful community reentry. However, the topic of the old prison didn't just go away. In fact, it's been a major skeleton in the closet for the community 
for decades now. In the years that followed the Old York prison closing, the abandoned structure would find itself at the center of a dramatic series of events. The initial discussions surrounding the prison's fate ranged between the unusual prospect of transforming it into a restaurant and the more utilitarian option of clearing it to make way for a parking lot. Among numerous other ideas, however, the narrative took a turn when the prison ownership changed hands. Ultimately, in 2014, the Redevelopment Authority of the City of York exercised eminent domain and claimed both the 2.9-acre property and the abandoned prison. This legal maneuver marked a pivotal moment in the prison's history. As it stands today, the future of the Old York County Prison remains uncertain, existing in a state of limbo. Meaning, these days, York County Prison is not a place where society sends its arrested. Rather, it's a place where curious people go and perhaps get arrested for trespassing. The facility is in absolute dire straits, with paint and wallpaper peeling off the walls, iron bars rusting, everything that's made of glass is broken, and the floors and stairways are extremely dilapidated and dangerous. Still, perhaps the impression is best summed up by someone who's actually been on the inside. So let's go ahead and read a quote from Scott Frederick's photo blog, reading, The York County Prison makes use of a center staircase and four cell blocks on each floor. You can get a real sense of what it must have been like to move around in this building if you had the opportunity as an inmate. Shades of yellow and green dominate throughout the building and are an interesting color of choice. In this environment, I find these colors to be rather freaky for a prison. Then again, maybe it's the peeling paint and the lighting that give me that vibe. But this condition recalled in the blog might not stay this way forever, as according to local sources, the abandoned prison is set up to function as a strategic point of presence for an extensive 400-mile fiber optic cable network that links the bustling city of New York to the technology hub of Ashburn, Virginia. The investment by United Fiber and Data was estimated at $30 million back in 2018. According to CEO Bill Hines, as he detailed in an interview with the New York Dispatch, this network will provide a vital and geographically diverse pathway, connecting the financial epicenter of the United States to the very core of the internet's data processing infrastructure. The company has vowed to make the center an aesthetically beautiful place in the community and assured the public that the prison's thick walls will reduce sound pollution caused by any noisy generators. Moreover, by having such a strategic data center in York County, the region will have a chance to retain its brightest minds as the workforce and potentially attract new talent to the region. In other words, a building that once protected Americans from the more dangerous elements of society might very well live on to safe house the nation's most sensitive information. Which I suppose brings us full circle, so we'll leave it there for today. But thank you all for watching and subscribing. And until next time, I'm Ryan Sokesh, signing off. Thanks again to Morgan & Morgan for sponsoring this video. Remember, if you're ever injured in an accident, you can submit a claim at www.forthepeople.com slash its history or by dialing pound law. That's pound 529 on your phone.